Hello, everyone, and welcome to this class. My name is Anne, and I will be reading Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone today. We will be looking at important vocabulary in the book. We will be talking about some reading strategies that you can use as you read the story to help you become a better reader. And also, I will be asking you some comprehension questions to make sure that you're understanding what is happening in the story. So let's get started today reading Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. I hope you are excited to learn about the vocabulary in this book. Some of the words are a little tricky. So I put together a little slide presentation so we can go through some of the words together, okay? So the first word I want to look at today is cloak. A cloak is a long, loose, sleeveless piece of clothing which people use to wear over their clothes when they went out, okay? Okay, so why is this important? Well, in the story, um, the Dursleys, this, the family that we're introduced to in the very beginning of the story, they start seeing people in the neighborhood and around the city wearing cloaks. And in their world, it's not a common type of clothing. So he, they start questioning, why is this happening? And Mr. Dursley sees many people, older people as well in the streets wearing cloaks. And he starts saying, this is too strange. Whoa, right? <laughs> okay, so cloak is the first word. The second word is owl. Owl. An owl is a bird with a flat face and large eyes and a small sharp beak. And most owls obtain their food by hunting small animals at night. So owls are nocturnal creatures. That means that they are active at night. And owls are an important symbol in Harry Potter. And in this story, Mr. Dursley starts seeing owls flying around the city during the daytime. So again, it's very mysterious. What are owls doing flying around the city? So the owl um, comes up as kind of this messenger bird as well. The owls deliver letters. Okay, so they're um, an important symbol in the book. And also, it's a hard word to pronounce, so I thought it would be a good word for you, owl. Okay, great. Let's go to the next word, drill. Drill. A drill is a tool or mach machine that you use for making holes. A drill is a tool or a machine that you use for making holes. Well, this is important because Mr. Dursley is, uh, he actually works with drills. He has a a shop where he sells drills, okay? This is kind of a typical hardware store. And so he talks a lot in the story about, oh, I hope today, I hope I sell a lot of drills today. Okay, so I thought it would be an important item for you to be aware of, okay? So drill, drill. And the next word is, this is a phrasal verb to pick out. To pick out is to choose, okay? Whoops. Okay, so, so in the story, in the first chapter, Mr. Dursley picks out some clothes to wear that day. Okay, so you can say he chooses a shirt or he picks out a shirt. And today I picked out this blue shirt to wear in class today because it's so comfortable. And what did you pick out to wear today? Okay, it's a great phrasal verb for you to be aware of. Pick out to choose. The next word is, uh, actually, this is a phrase or an idiom, to not be able to bear, okay, or to not bear, to dislike very much, okay? Let's talk about how this is used in the story, to not bear something. So this is when you really can't stand something, you don't like it, you're not going to put up with it, okay? And in the story, there's some things that Mr. Dursley just can't bear. He doesn't like it at all, okay? So we will soon discover what it is that he does not like or that he can't bear, um, okay? So 
be aware of that. Let's try to remember when it comes up in the story. Okay. All right. So to not bear. Uh, okay. So that concludes the vocabulary section. Just to get started, it's always good to review some of the keywords in the story before you read it so that you are more of aware and ready to go. Here are a few strategies where we will be talking about while we read. Good readers make predictions while they read. What does that mean? It means that they think about what's going to happen next in the story, okay? Number two, they create visual images while they read. What does this mean? Well, as you read, you have this picture in your mind of what is happening in the story, okay? Good readers ask questions while they read. Okay, you may have a question and you may think, hmm, what, why is he doing that exactly? Okay, and you can write down your question on a little note, for example, as you read. It's a good strategy. Another topic is to reread what you just read to check to see if you understood it. Oftentimes we read things very quickly, maybe we're distracted and we didn't really understand what we just read. So in that case, we can go back and read it again. So as we read the book today, I'll be going through some of these reading strategies with you and helping you get more comfortable with using those strategies while you're reading the story. Okay, so let's go ahead and read um, the first chapter of Harry Potter together. Let's get started with this. Chapter one, The Boy Who Lived. Mr. and Miss Dursley of number four, Pivot Drive, were proud to say they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. They were the last people you'd expect to be involved in anything strange or mysterious because they just didn't hold with such nonsense. Mr. Dursley was the director of a firm called Grunnings, which made drills. We know what those are because we just learned that word, right? He was a big, beefy man with hardly any neck, although he did have a very large mustache. Miss Dursley was thin and blonde and had nearly twice the usual amount of neck, which came in very useful as she spent so much of her time craning over garden fences, spying on the neighbors. The Dursleys had a small son called Dudley, and in their opinion, there was no finer boy anywhere. So in this part of the story, the author is really introducing some of the key characters, the Dursley family, and showing that they really position themselves as, oh, we're perfect, right? We're, we're a normal family. But he, she also describes Mr. Dursley as a large man with a mustache, right? And Mrs. Dursley likes to kind of gossip and see what the neighbors are doing, okay? So let's keep looking down. Uh, at the next part. The Dursleys had everything they wanted, but they also had a secret, okay? They had a secret. And their greatest fear was that somebody would discover it. They didn't think they could bear it if anyone found out about the Potters. Miss Potter was Mrs. Dursley's sister, but they hadn't met for several years. In fact, Miss Dursley pretended she didn't have a sister because her sister and her good-for-nothing husband were as un-Dursley-ish as it was possible to be. The Dursleys shuddered to think what the neighbors would say if the Potters arrived in the street. The Dursleys knew that the Potters had a small son too, but they had never seen him. This boy was another good reason for keeping the Potters away. They didn't want Dud Dudley mixing with a child like that. Okay, so what, what we see here is a great level of contrast. You have the 
Dursleys who consider themselves to be perfect. And then you have the Potters. Miss Dursley's sister is a Potter. And they also have a son, but their son is quite different and quite strange. And they don't want Dudley, right, their perfect son, interacting or being friends with the Potter's son. Okay, so you see that they have this secret, right? They have this secret. What is the secret? Okay, so, well, hmm, there must be something strange about the Potters that they don't want other people to know. Okay, now let's go on. Uh, I can show you where we are here. When Mr. and Miss Dursley woke up on a dull gray day, gray Tuesday, our story starts. There was nothing about the cloudy sky outside to suggest that strange and mysterious things would soon be happening all over the country. Mr. Dursley hummed as he picked out his most boring tie for work. And Mrs. Dursley gossiped away happily as she wrestled a screaming Dudley into his high chair. So in this paragraph, we see that it's just a normal average day, nothing special, nothing strange happening. But as a reader, we have to use our strategy here and start thinking, hmm, but why is she mentioning that nothing strange is happening, right? Maybe something odd or different or is going to happen, okay? So I use, as you can see here, we uh, use the, the phrasal verb pick out. Do you see where he picked out his most boring tie for work? Okay, he chose it. That's the one he chose for the day. And wrestled means like she's grabbing him. She's using kind of force to put him in his high chair, which is a chair that babies sit in while they eat. Okay, so as a, a one strategy you can use at this point is just, just kind of um, predict, make a prediction. Hmm. Well, maybe I predict something strange is going to happen today because the, the author is mentioning this. So let's continue reading here. None of them noticed a large tawny owl flutter past the window. Here we're introduced to the bird, the owl. At half past eight, Mr. Dursley picked up his briefcase, pecked Miss Dursley on the cheek, a light kiss, and tried to kiss Dudley goodbye, but missed because Dudley was now having a tantrum and throwing his cereal at the walls. Okay, a tantrum is when children scream and ah, say no, no, no. Okay, so he's, being, he's misbehaving. Little tyke, chorted Mr. Dursley as he left the house. He got into his car and backed out of number four's drive. Okay, so he's backing out and he's getting ready to drive to work. But something strange is, is, coming, is coming about, is, is happening in the neighborhood. It was on the corner of the street that he noticed the first sign of something pe peculiar. A cat reading a map? For a second, Mr. Dursley didn't realize that he, what he had seen. Then he jerked his head around to look again. There was a tabby cat standing on the corner of Privet Drive, but there wasn't a map in sight. What could he have been thinking of? It must have been a trick of the light. Mr. Dursley blinked and stared at the cat. It stared back. As Mr. Dursley drove around the corner and up the road, he watched the cat in his mirror. <laughs> it was now reading the sign that said Privet Drive. No, oh, looking at the sign, cats don't read maps or signs. Mr. Dursley gave himself a little shake and put the cat out of his mind. As he drove toward town, he thought of nothing except a large order of drills he was hoping to get that day. Okay, so he's starting to see some strange things in the story um, in his neighborhood, and but he wants to not think about it and think about his job. So he wants to sell some drills at work today. All right, let's keep reading here. Good, let's start here. But on the edge of town, 
drills were driven out of his mind by something else. He's, you could make a prediction here. Oh, maybe he's going to start seeing uh, fish flying through the sky, something like that. Okay. So good readers are always predicting what else could he see, right? As he sat in the usual morning traffic jam, he couldn't help noticing that there seemed to be a lot of strangely dressed people about. People in cloaks. Do you remember the cloaks, the cloak word that I showed you at the beginning, those large robes that people were wearing? Um, Mr. Dursley couldn't help, couldn't bear people who dressed in funny clothes. So as you can see, it couldn't bear, meaning he can't stand it. He doesn't like wearing, seeing these people dressed in funny clothes. The, uh, the get-ups you saw on young people. He supposed this was some stupid new fashion. He drummed his fingers on the steering wheel, and his eyes fell on a huddle of those weirdos standing quite close by. They were whispering excitedly together. <laughs> Mr. Dursley was enraged to see that a couple of them weren't young at all. Why, that man had to be older than he was and wearing an emerald green cloak, the nerve of him. But then it struck Mr. Dursley that this was probably some silly stunt. These people were obviously collecting for something. Yes, that would be it. The traffic moved on, and a few minutes later, Mr. Dursley arrived in the Grunnings parking lot, his mind back on drills. Okay, very good. So if we think about this and what's happening here, uh, we start to see some mysterious things going on in the city and in the neighborhood, right? So we have to kind of think, hmm. Maybe it's a good idea to, to take some notes on some of the strange things that he's seeing. Mr. Dursley always sat, always sat with his back to the window in his office on the ninth floor. He, if he hadn't, he might have found it harder to concentrate on drills that morning. He didn't see the owls swooping past in broad daylight, though people down in the street did. They pointed and gazed, open-mouthed, okay, open-mouthed as owl after owl sped overhead, okay? So he's not the only one thinking this is a bit strange. Everyone else is kind of like, whoa, there's owls flying around. Most of them had never seen an owl, even at nighttime. Mr. Dursley, however, had a perfectly normal owl-free morning. He yelled at five different people, so this kind of shows his personality. He's kind of like, he, he can be mean at work to his employees. He made several important telephone calls and shouted a bit more. He was in a very good mood until lunchtime. Hmm. So we can also ask a question. Hmm. Well, what happened at lunchtime that made him suddenly in a bad mood? When he thought he'd stretch his legs and walk across the road to buy himself a bun from the bakery, he'd forgotten all about the people in cloaks until he passed a group of them next to the bakers. He eyed them angrily as he passed. He didn't know why, but they made him uneasy. They made him uncomfortable. This brunch, uh, this bunch, this group, were whispering excitedly too, and he couldn't see a single collecting tin. It was on his way back past them, clutching a large donut in a bag, that he caught a few words of what they were saying. The Potters, that's right. That's what I heard. Yes, their son, Harry. Mr. Dursley stopped dead. Fear flooded. Fear flooded him. He looked back at the whispers as if he wanted to say something to them, but he thought better of it. Okay, he dashed back across the road, hurried up to his office, snapped his secretary, snapped at his secretary. He said something kind of angrily at her. 
um, not to disturb him. He's like, don't disturb me. And then he seized his phone er, to seize this to grab his telephone and had almost finished dialing his home number when he changed his mind. He put the receiver back down, stroked his mustache, thinking, no, he was being stupid. Potter wasn't such an unusual name. He was sure that there were lots of people called Potter. All right, let me scroll up a little bit. Okay, let's see where we are here. Da, 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 da. Yeah, who had a son called Harry. So, so he's thinking Potter's a common name. There are a lot of people with this name. It couldn't be the Harry Potter that is kind of like their secret, their family secret that they don't want anyone to know about, okay? So come to think of it, he wasn't sure his nephew was called Harry. He'd never even seen the boy, okay? So this, again, showing that they don't have a good relationship, even though it's his wife's sister's son, right? Um, which would be like his nephew, he, he's never even met him. It might have been Harvey or Harold. There was no point in worrying. Miss Dursley, she always got so upset at any mention of her sister. He didn't blame her. If he'd had a sister like that, but all the same, those people in cloaks, well, he found it a lot harder to concentrate on drills that afternoon. And when he left the building at five o'clock, he was so worried that he walked straight into someone just outside the door. Okay, so as you can see, he's just thinking, this can't be true. This can't be Harry, right? Has to be somebody else. But anyway, finally, when he's done working, he knocks someone down. He pushes someone as he's trying to go outside. Ah, sorry, he grunted as the tiny old man uh, let's see, as the tiny old man stumbled and almost fell, Brrr, okay? It was a few seconds before Mr. Dursley realized that the man was wearing a violet cloak. Again, the image of the cloak comes back, this strange clothing to be wearing at this time in history. He didn't seem at all upset at being almost knocked to the ground. On the contrary, his face lit into a wide smile. And he said in a squeaky voice that made passerby that made passerby stare, "Don't worry, my dear sir, for nothing could upset me today. Rejoice, for you know who has gone at last. Even muggles like yourself should be celebrating this happy, happy day." All right. So, well, good readers ask questions as they read, and as I'm reading this, I'm thinking, "Well, what are they celebrating?" what are we happy about? You know, what, what's going on here? Why are people celebrating this? Why should we be excited and, and pleased? All right, very good. And the old man hugged Mr. Dursley around the middle and walked off. Very strange, huh? He hugged him, a complete stranger who he doesn't know. He hugged him and then just walked off. Mr. Dursley stood rooted to the spot. He had been hugged by a complete stranger. He also thought he had been called a muggle, whatever that was. He was rattled. This is kind of shocked, surprised. He hurried to his car and set off for home. Set off means to go towards his house, okay? Uh, hoping he was imagining things, which he had never hoped before because he didn't approve of imagination. <laughs> as he, I'm, I'm laughing because he's, tr he's trying to be this, this sort of like, ah, kind of straightforward person who doesn't uh, use a lot of creativity or imagination. But since he's seeing so many things strangely appearing in the world, he thinks like, whoa, I, I hope that I'm, I'm imagining this. As he pulled into the driveway of number four, the first thing he saw and didn't improve his mood, and it didn't improve his mood, was the tabby cat he spotted that morning. It was now sitting on his garden wall. He wasn't sure it was the same one. It had the same markings around its eyes. Shoo, said Mr. Dursley loudly. The cat didn't move. It just gave him a stern, serious look. Was this normal cat behavior? Mr. Dursley wondered, 
mm, trying to pull himself together, he let himself into the house. He was still determined not to mention anything to his wife. Miss Dursley had had a nice, normal day. She told him over dinner all about Mrs. Next Door's problems with her daughter and how Dudley had learned a new word, won't. So again, this is speaking to um, his wife as being uh, someone who's interested in, in what the neighbors are doing and interested in kind of gossiping, okay? Because she's talking about the next door's problems. Mr. Dursley tried to act normally. When Dudley had been put to bed, he went into the living room in time to catch the last report on the evening news. Okay, so be aware that Mrs. Dursley hasn't really been downtown. She hasn't been noticing all of these strange happenings. And Mr. Dursley really hasn't told her um, what he's been seeing, okay? Because he's trying to he's trying to just think, oh, this is all a figment of my imagination. I'm just imagining all of this. So now he's going to be watching the news and let's see what he um, hears about on the news. And finally, bird watchers everywhere have reported that the nation's owls have been behaving very unusually today. Now, realize that this is national. This is all over the country. This isn't just in his city. Although owls normally hunt at night and are hardly ever seen in daylight, there have been hundreds of sightings of these birds flying in every direction since sunrise. Experts are unable to explain why the owls have suddenly changed their sleeping pattern. The newscaster allowed himself a grin. Most mysterious. And now over to Jim McGuffin with the weather. Going to be any more shower, showers of owls tonight, Jim? So let's hear what the weatherman says now. Well, Ted, says the weather, said the weatherman. I don't know about that, but it's not only the owls that have been acting oddly today. Viewers as far apart as Kent, Yorkshire, and Dundee have been phoning in to tell me that instead of the rain I promised yesterday, they've, been, they've had a downpour of shooting stars. Perhaps people have been celebrating bonfire night early. It's not until next week, folks, but I can promise a wet night tonight. <laughs> so very strange, right? It's, it's a shower of shooting stars. Mr. Dursley sat frozen in his arm's chair. Shooting stars all over Britain? Owls flying by daylight, mysterious people in cloaks all over the place, and a whisper, whisper about the potters. I see some suspense here. There's some mystery here. We really want to keep reading, right, to figure out what is going on. Why are all of these strange things appearing? Miss Dursley came into the living room carrying two cups of tea. It was no good. He'd have to say something to her. He cleared his throat nervously. <clears throat> um, Petunia, dear, you haven't heard from your sister lately, have you? As he had expected, Miss Dursley looked shocked and angry. After all, they normally pretended they didn't have a sister. No, she said sharply. Why? Funny stuff on the news, Mr. Dursley mumbled. Owls, shooting stars. And there were a lot of funny looking people in town today. So, snapped Miss Dursley. Well, I just thought maybe it was something to do with, you know, her crowd. Miss Dursley sipped her tea through her pursed lips. Mr. Dursley wondered whether he dared tell her he'd heard the, the name Potter. He decided he did, didn't dare. Instead, he said as casually as he could, their son, he'd be about Dudley's age, you know, wouldn't he? I suppose so, said Mrs. Dursley stiffly. What's his name again? Howard, isn't it? Harry. 
nasty, common name, if you ask me. Oh, yes, said Mr. Dursley, his heart sinking horribly. Yes, I quite agree. So now his, um, the fact that he had heard people talking about Harry Potter in the city that, that morning, now he's realizing, oh, no, there could be, somehow there could be a relationship here between <laughs> Harry Potter and her sister and something's happening with them. He didn't say another word on the subject as they went upstairs to bed. While Mrs. Dursley was in the bathroom, Mr. Dursley crept to the bedroom window and peered down into the front garden. The cat was still there. It was staring down Pivot Drive as though it were waiting for something. Usually, this is very strange because cats usually run around. They don't just stay in one place too long, right? They're always kind of moving. Was he imagining things? Could all this have anything to do with the potters? If it did, if it got out that they were related to a pair of, well, he didn't think he could bear it. The Dursleys got into bed. Mr. Dursley fell asleep quickly. Sorry, Mrs. Dursley fell asleep quickly, but Mr. Dursley lay awake, turning it, turning it all over in his mind. So he's kind of like, oh, he can't sleep. His last comforting thought before he fell asleep was that even if the potters were involved, there was no reason for them to come near him and Mrs. Dursley. The potters knew very well what he and Petunia thought about him and their kind. He couldn't see how he and Petunia could get mixed up in anything. that might be going on. He yawned and turned over. It, could, it couldn't affect them. Okay, so sometimes if you read something quite quickly, good readers oftentimes reread the text one more time to make sure that they understood everything here. Okay, so as we're seeing, because he's saying that there was no reason for them to come near him and Mrs. Jersley, the Potters knew very well what he and Petunia thought of them and their kind. So Petunia, because I'm just being introduced to this name, right? Petunia, Petunia is obviously Miss Dursley. He couldn't see how he and Petunia could get mixed up with anything. So he's just thinking to himself, oh God, we're so different. The, the Potters and us, we're sort of a perfect family and they're such a strange family. How could this be happening? Well, he yawned. He, he just fell asleep at that point. He yawned and turned over and... He's like, it, it's not going to affect us, right? How very wrong he was. Mr. Dursley might have been drifting into an uneasy sleep, but the cat on the wall outside was showing no signs of sleepiness. It was sitting as still as a statue, its eyes fixed unblinkingly on the far corner of Privet Drive. It didn't so much as quiver, when a car door slammed on the street, on the next street, nor when two owls swooped overhead. In fact, it was nearly midnight before the cat moved at all. A man appeared on the corner the cat had been watching, appeared so suddenly and silently, you'd have thought he just popped out of the ground. The cat's tail twitched and its eyes narrowed, okay? Nothing like this man had ever been seen on Privet Drive. He was tall, thin, and very old, judging by the silver of his hair and beard, which were both long enough to tuck into his belt. So he obviously has this kind of wizard beard, right? He was wearing long robes, a purple cloak that swept the ground, and high-heeled buckled boots. His blue eyes were light, bright, and sparkling behind half-moon spectacles, and his nose was very long and crooked, as though it had been broken at least twice. The man's name was Albus Dumbledore. Okay, so you're thinking, wow, what an interesting character, the way they describe him physically with his long robe and his long wizard-like beard. Albus Dumbledore didn't seem to realize that 
He had just arrived in a street where everything from his name to his boots was unwelcome. He was busy rummaging in his cloak, looking for something. But he did seem to realize he was being watched because he looked up suddenly at the cat, which was still staring at him from the other side of the street. For some reason, the sight of the cat seemed to amuse him, okay, entertain him. He chuckled and muttered, <laughs> I should have known. He found what he was looking for in his inside pocket. It seemed to be a silver cigarette lighter. Okay, so inside, he pulled out this lighter from his pocket. He flicked it open, held it up in the air, and clicked it. The nearest street lamp went out with a little pop. He clicked it again, and the next lamp flickered into darkness. Twelve times he clicked the put outer until the only lights left on the whole street were two tiny pinpricks in the distance, which were the eyes of the cat watching him. Kind of creepy, right? It's the only thing, it's the only light he could see. If anyone looked out of their window now, even beady-eyed Mrs. Dursley, they wouldn't be able to see anything. It's black that was happening down in the pavement. Dumbledore slipped the put-outer back inside the cloak and set off down the street toward number four, where he sat down on the next on the wall next to the cat. He didn't look at it, but after a moment, spoke to it. So let's think as readers, let's ask a question. Hmm, I wonder what he's going to say to the cat. Fancy seeing you here, Professor McGonagall. He turned to smile at the tabby, but it was gone. Instead, he was smiling at a rather severe looking woman who was wearing square glasses, exactly the shape of the markings the cat had had around its eyes. She too was wearing a cloak, an emerald one. Her black hair was drawn into a tight bun. She looked distinctly ruffled. So as you can see, I kind of had to think about, hmm, did this cat just turn into a person? Okay, because if you, if you reread that part, you think, oh, he turned it to a smile at the tabby, but it was gone. So the cat's gone, but replacing the cat was this woman, okay? Okay, how did you know it was me, she asked. My dear professor, I've never seen a, a cat sit so stiffly. You'd be stiff if you'd been sitting on a brick wall all day, said Professor McGonagall. All day? When you could have when you could have been celebrating? I must have passed a dozen feasts and parties on my way here. Okay, so again, we're getting the idea that they're celebrating something. There's something really positive and wonderful happening that everyone is celebrating. But, but while they were celebrating, the professor was just waiting on the wall. Oh, yes, I've been celebrating all right, she said impatiently. You'd think they'd be a bit more careful, but no. Even the muggles have noticed something going on. It was on their news. She jerked her head back at the Dursley's dark living room window. I heard it. Flocks of owls, shooting stars. Well, they're not completely stupid. They were bound to notice something. Shooting stars down in Kent. I'll bet that was Dedalus Diggle. He never had much sense. Okay, so they're attributing those shooting stars to a particular magician or wizard, perhaps, doing that. Okay, so let's, let's, I'll show you where I am in the text here. So, you can't blame them, said Dumbledore gently. We've had precious little to celebrate for 11 years. So, for 11 years, they just, it's been very tough. They haven't had much to celebrate at all, okay? I don't know, said Professor McGonagall irritably, but that's no reason to lose our heads. People are being downright careless out on the streets in broad daylight, not even dressed in muggle clothes, swapping rumors. She threw a sharp sideways glance at Dumbledore there, as though hoping he was going to tell her something, but he didn't, so she went on. A fine thing it would be if, on the very day you know who seems to have disappeared at last, the muggles found out about us all. I suppose he really has gone, Dumbledore. It certainly seems so, said Dumbledore. 
We have much to be thankful for. Would you care for a lemon drop? A what? A lemon drop. They're a kind of muggle sweet I'm rather fond of. No, thank you, said Professor McGonagall coldly, as if, as though she didn't think this was the moment for lemon drops. Let me stop there for a second. Um, so in, in the previous paragraph, she mentions, um, you know, on the very day, you know who seems to have disappeared at last. So it sounds like they're talking about someone going away, um, maybe dying, right? But we don't really know who that person is. But this person has disappeared at last. And perhaps because of that, they are celebrating. Okay. So let's keep going here. We're talking about the lemon, the lemon drops. And now you kind of see the word muggle here. Okay, so, well, we're kind of wondering, what is a muggle? Okay, a muggle, the kind of muggle sweet food I'm rather fond of. So ask yourself, what are, we've heard the word muggle mentioned many times. Okay, what could they be referring to? Okay, we really don't know yet, but perhaps soon the author or eventually we will find out, the author will tell us what a muggle is, but maybe we can kind of start questioning. Hmm, that's really interesting. Let's keep being aware of when this word comes up. So will she accept the lemon drop or not? No, thank you, said Professor McGonagall coldly, as though she didn't think this was the moment for lemon drops. As I say, if you know who has gone, okay? My dear professor, surely a sensible person like you can call him by his name. All this you know who nonsense for 11 years, I've been trying to persuade people to call him by his proper name, Voldemort. Professor McGonagall flinched, but Dumbledore, who was unsticking Two lemon drops seem to notice, seem not to notice. It, it all gets so confusing if we keep saying, you know who. I have never seen any reason to be frightened of saying Voldemort's name. Okay, so just by the name itself, right? And the fact that nobody wants to say this name, it kind of makes you think that perhaps this is kind of like an evil, maybe this is an evil person, okay? Um, all right, so let's keep reading here. I know you haven't, said Professor McGonagall, sounding half exasperated, half admiring, but you're different. Everyone knows you're the only one you know. All, oh, all right, Voldemort was frightened of. So um, you're different. Everyone knows you're the only one you know. She almost says, you know who? Oh, all right, Voldemort was frightened of. So as I reread that, we realized, oh, Voldemort was frightened of this particular person. Okay. You flatter me, said Dumbledore calmly. Voldemort had powers I will never have. Okay. So we get the sense that Voldemort was this powerful yet perhaps evil entity. Only because you're too well noble to use them. It's lucky. I, it's lucky it's dark. I haven't blushed so much since Madame Pomfrey told me she liked my earmuffs. Okay, so he's very flattered by this compliment that Voldemort was scared of him and that he's so powerful. Mr. McGonagall, Professor McGonagall shot a sharp look at Dumbledore and said, the owls are nothing next to the rumors that are flying around. You know what they're saying about what he's about why he's disappeared, about what finally stopped him. Ooh, what do you think? Hmm, what finally made Voldemort disappear? What finally stopped him? This is all so mysterious. And doesn't it make you want to keep reading to find out what stopped him? It seemed that Professor McGonagall had reached the point she was most anxious to discuss the real reason she had been waiting on a cold, hard wall all day for neither as a cat nor as a woman she had fixed Dumbledore with such a piercing stare as she did now. It was plain that whatever everyone was saying, she was not going to believe it until Dumbledore told her it was true. Dumbledore, however, was cho choosing another lemon drop and did not answer. 
What they're saying, she pressed on, is that last night Voldemort turned up in Godric's hollow. He went to find the Potters. The rumor is that Lily and James Potter are, are, that they're, they're dead. Oh, wow. This is just revealing an important piece of information, that the Potters are dead. So does this make you think, oh, the Potters, Harry's mother and father, they're dead. So what about Harry? Is Harry dead too? What's going on with Harry? Dumbledore bowed his head. Professor McGonagall gasped. <gasps> Lily and James, I can't believe it. I didn't want to believe it. Oh, Albus. Oh. Dumbledore reached out and patted her on the shoulder to comfort her. I know, I know, he said heavily. Professor McGonagall's voice trembled as, as she went on. That's not all. They're saying he's tried to kill the Potter's son, Harry, but he couldn't. He couldn't kill that little boy. No one knows why or how, but they're saying that when he tried to kill Harry Potter, Voldemort's power somehow broke and that's why he's gone. Dumbledore nodded gloomily. It's true. It's, it's, it's true, faltered Professor McGonagall. After all he's done, all the people he's killed, he couldn't kill that little boy? It's just astounding of all the things to stop him. But how in the name of heaven did Harry survive? Okay, so here we see like, whoa, Voldemort, this powerful, perhaps evil figure was, he killed Harry Potter's parents, but he wasn't able to ki kill Harry Potter. So why? Why, what about Harry kind of was powerful enough to block the, the evil kind of power of Voldemort? We can only guess, said Dumbledore. We may never know. Ooh, we may never know. Professor McGonagall pulled out a lace handkerchief and dabbed her eyes beneath her spectacles. Dumbledore gave her a, a, a great sniff as he took a golden watch from his pocket and examined it. He's looking carefully at it. It was a very odd watch. It had 12 hands, but no numbers. Instead, little planets were moving around the edge. It must have made sense to Dumbledore though, because he put it back in his pocket and said, Hagrid's late. I suppose it was he who told you I'd be here, by the way. Yes, said Professor McGonagall, and I suppose you're going to tell me why you're here of all places. I've come to bring Harry to his aunt and uncle. They're the only family he has now. Ooh. So as we can see, this sort of is a key moment in the story where we realize, whoa, they're going to bring Harry to this family to the Dursley's home, because that's the only family that he has now. Okay. Ooh, this is revealing a special event in, in the chapter. Okay. All right, so let's start here. You, you don't mean, you can't mean the people who lived there, cried Professor McGonagall. Oh, uh, let me read that again with a little bit more emotion. She's saying, you can't mean the people who live there. And she point, probably points to the house, cried Professor McGonagall, jumping to her feet and pointing at number four. Dumbledore, you can't. I've been watching them all day. You couldn't find two people who are less like us. And they've got this son. I saw him kicking his mother all the way up the street, screaming for sweets. Harry Potter came, uh, come and live here. It's the best place for him, said Dumbledore firmly. His aunt and uncle will be able to explain everything to him when he's older. I've written them a letter. A letter, repeated Professor McGonagall faintly, sitting back down on the wall. Really, Dumbledore? You think he, you can explain all this in a letter? These people will never understand him. He'll be famous. 
a legend. I wouldn't be surprised if today he was known as Harry Potter. If today was known as Harry Potter Day in the future, there will be books written about Harry. Every child in our world will know his name. Exactly, said Dumbledore, looking very seriously over the top of his half moon glasses. It would be enough to turn any boy's head. Famous. Before he can walk and talk, famous for something he won't even remember. Can you see how much better off he'll be growing up away from all that until he's ready to take it? Ooh. Professor McGonagall opened her mouth, changed her mind, swallowed, and then said, yes, yes, you're right, of course. But how is he, how is the boy getting here, Dumbledore? She, she eyed his cloak suddenly as though she thought he might be hiding Harry underneath it. Hagrid's bringing him. You think it's wise to trust Hagrid with something as important as this? I would trust Hagrid with my life, said Dumbledore. I'm not saying his heart isn't in the right place, said Professor McGonagall grudgingly, but you can't pretend he's not careless. He does tend to, what's that? A low rumbling sound had broken the silence around them. It grew steadily louder and louder as they looked up and down the street for some sign of her headlight. It swelled to a roar, a very loud roar, like the sound a lion makes as they both looked up to the sky and a huge motorcycle fell out of the air and landed in the road in front of them. If the motorcycle was huge, it was nothing to the man sitting astride it. He was almost twice as tall as a normal man and at least five times as wide. He, he looked simply too big to be allowed and so wild. Long tangles of bushy black hair and a beard hid among most his face. He had hands the size of trash can lids and his feet in the leather boots were like baby dolphins in his vast muscular arms. He was holding a bundle of blankets. Hagrid, said Dumbledore, sounding relieved. At last, and where did you get the motorcycle? Borrowed it, Professor Dumbledore, sir, said the giant, climbing carefully off the motorcycle as he spoke. Young Sirius Black lent it to me. I've got him, sir. No problems were, were there. No problems were there, he says. No, sir. House was almost destroyed, but I got him out all right before the muggles started swarming around. He fell asleep as if he was flying over Bristol. Dumbledore and Professor McGonagall bent forward over the bundle of blankets. Inside, just visible, was a baby boy fast asleep. Under a tuft of jet black hair over the, his forehead, forehead, they could see a curiously shaped cut like a bolt of lightning. Is that where, Professor whispered Professor McGonagall? Yes, said Dumbledore. He'll have the scar forever. Okay, so there's a scar on his forehead. Couldn't you do something about it, Dumbledore? Even if I could, I wouldn't. Scars come in handy. I have one myself above my left knee. That was a perfect map of the London underground. Well, give him here, Hagrid. We'd better get this over with. Dumbledore took Harry in his arms and turned towards Durs the Dursley's house. Could I, could I say goodbye to him, sir? asked Hagrid. He bent his great shaggy head over Harry and gave him what must have been a very scratchy, whiskery kiss. Then suddenly Hagrid let out a howl like a wounded dog. Oh, shh, hissed Professor McGonagall. You'll wake the muggles. S -s Sorry, hobbed, sobbed Hagrid, oh, oh, oh. taking out a large spotted handkerchief and burying his face in it. But I can't, I can't stand it. Lily and James dead and poor little Harry off to, lives with the muggles. Yes, yes, it's all very sad, but get a grip on yourself, Hagrid, or we'll be found. Professor McGonagall whispered, patting Hagrid gingerly on the arm as Dumbledore stepped over the low garden wall and walked to the front door. He laid Harry gently on the doorstep, took a letter out of his cloak, tucked it inside Harry's blanket, and then came back to the other two. For a full minute, the three of them stood and looked at the little bundle. Hagrid's shoulders shook. 
Professor McGonagall blinked furiously, and the twinkling light that usually shone from Dumbledore's eyes seemed to have gone out. Well, said the Dumbledore finally, that's that. We've no business staying here. We may as well go and join the celebrations. Yeah, said Hagrid in a very muffled voice. I'll be taken serious. His bike back. Good night, Professor McGonagall, Professor Dumbledore, sir. Wiping his streaming eyes with his jacket sleeve, Hagrid swung himself on the motorcycle and kicked the engine into life. With a roar, it rose into the air and off into the night. I shall see you soon. I expect Professor McGonagall, said Dumbledore, nodding to her. Professor McGonagall blew her nose in reply. <laughs> Dumbledore uh, turned and walked back down the street on the corner. He stopped and took the silver put outer. He clicked it once, bloop, and the 12 balls of light sped back to their street lamps so that Privet Drive, glow, Privet Drive glowed suddenly orange, and he could make out a baby, a tabby cat, slinking around the corner of the other street on the, at, at the end of the street. He could just see the bundle of blankets on the step of number four. Good luck, Harry, he murmured. He turned on his heel, and with a swish of his cloak, he was gone. He disappeared. A breeze ruffled the neat hedges of Privet Drive, which lay silent and tidy under the inky sky. The very last place you would expect astonishing things to happen. Harry Potter rolled over inside his blankets without waking up. One small hand closed on the letter um, beside him and slept on. He, uh, not knowing he was special, not knowing he was famous, not knowing he would be woken in a few hours time by Mrs. Dursley's scream as she opened the front door and put out the milk bottles, nor that he would spend the next few weeks being prodded and pinched by his cousin Dudley. He could not know that at this very moment, people meeting in secret all over the country were holding up their glasses and saying in hushed voices, to Harry Potter, the boy who lived. And that concludes the very first chapter in Harry Potter, the Sorcerer's Stone. The next chapter is uh, entitled The Vanishing Glass. And now that we've read chapter one, I would like to go over a few um, comprehension questions with you to make sure that you understood uh, what happened in the story. So here we have a few questions. First of all, what was the secret that Mr. and Mrs. Dursley wanted to keep quiet from everyone in the community? Okay, what was their secret? Did it have something to do with the Potters, with uh, Mrs. Dursley's sister and the Potter family? Okay, there was something they wanted to keep quiet. Number two, list the many strange and mysterious happenings that Mr. Dursley noticed on his way back, on his way to work this dull, cloudy Tuesday. So there was, were a number of sightings and appearances and things that he saw that he thought, whoa, this is not normal. What is going on? Describe the news Mr. Dursley heard on the television that night. Okay, what did he hear? What were some of the sightings? What were the reporters saying that, that, were, that they were seeing all over the nation? Okay, number four, why do you think it was so important that Mr. Dursley asked about his wife's sister and that a telephone call was made? Okay. Uh, after the news, after they watched the news, do you remember when he said, oh, have you heard from your sister? Has he, um, what was the name of, of your sister's son? Because he's never met him. But why do you think it was important for him to ask her those questions? Now, strange things were happening. Things, strange things happened while the Dursley family slept. Illustrate two main characters who met together on Privet Drive. Okay, so you can do some illustrations and do some drawings uh, to make sure that to check your understanding understandings. Um, so, um, do you remember much about them? About their conversation? What were they talking about? Um, okay. And what, did, what, did, how do you imagine Dumbledore with his long white beard and his cloak? Okay. 
and the professor, what did she look like with those square glasses, okay? Question number six. Oh, sorry. Oh, let's go back to question number six. How, what did Hagrid bring to be placed on the doorstep of the Dursley's porch? What was under those blankets? Okay. What was it, this special, this special gift that they were leaving at the Dursley's doorstep? Number, um, let's see, that was number, I'm getting cut, six, number seven. So a letter was attached to the blankets explaining the situation. Pretend that you are Albus Dumbledore. Write a letter to the Dursley family explaining the reason for baby Harry Potter's arrival. So this is a good writing activity and a follow-up activity you can do as homework. You can write a letter saying, Dear Mr. and Mrs. Dursley. Okay, how would you explain this? We know that the Dursleys are the only living family that Harry has. So maybe you could mention the fact that he needs to be treated with love because his parents were killed. Okay, you may not be able to talk about um, how exactly they were killed, but you could say that he has no more family left. He needs a family to take care of him. And number eight, uh, list what noticeable markings was found on the baby's forehead. Okay, there was a noticeable scar, right? Left on the baby's forehead. Could this marking have any future significance in the child's life and explain? Because you, you remember that, I, I think it was Hagrid that said he had a, a scar of the underground, of a map of the underground under one of his knees. And that was used as like a way for him to find where he was or where he, when he was lost, he could find his way. So in this, respect what could the scar on harry potter's for forehead um help him with in the future great okay excellent okay everyone well that concludes today's lesson on the first chapter of harry potter and the sorcerer's stone today we looked at some of the key vocabulary words in the book Okay, and some key phrases that came up several times. And we also read the story using a variety of strategies. And I demonstrated how to how good readers stop and ask questions or create mental pictures in their minds and make predictions while they read. And then we concluded by asking some key com comprehension questions to see if you understood what happened in the chapter. I hope you've enjoyed the beginning of the story as much as I have, and I look forward to reading you chapter two. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.